Hello, everyone. I'm Ming Hu Wang from Tsinghua University, and I'm very glad here to present our paper, Understanding I.O. Direct Catcher Sets Performance for End House Networking. As we all observe, in recent years, fast involving data intensive workloads such as deep learning model training, microservice backends of large online platforms, and virtual network functions encourage the rapid improvement of network hardware. Now, in-house networking has hundreds of gigabyte scale bandwidth and microsecond level latency. The fast increasing networking speed significantly impacts architecture of in-house hardware. As shown in the figure, since 1980, NICs and processor bandwidth has increased by more than 10,000 times and 10 times more than the increase of memory. NIC and processor latency has dropped by around 100 times, also 10 times more than memory. Similar to the processor, NIC now meets the memory wall. It means that the memory may encumber fast NIC in a system and prevents us from reaching NIC's maximum available speed. As we know, memory is the primary bridge between NIC and processors. Let's introduce how NIC and processor interact by using packet receiving as an example. As shown in the figure, NIC and the processor communicate where a ring in the memory. NIC controls the ring head where the processor controls the ring tail. Each item in the ring is a descriptor that maps to a buffer in the memory. When a packet arrives, NIC reads the address of the buffer mapped by the ring tail, writes packet to the buffer, updates the descriptor to show that it maps to a received packet now and moves the tail to the next empty entry for false packets. It may issue and interrupt the notified processor of the arrival of new packets. The processor then reads the descriptor pointed by the ring head to see whether the new packets are available. If so, it reads packets content from the front buffer, maps the descriptor to a new empty buffer, and moves the head on to the next entry. This model is very robust. Thus, we could understand these interactions with another mental model, as shown on the right. We could consider both the receiving ring and the transmitting rings as two queens separated by the ring head and tail. Buffers are moved between these four FIFO queens in order by NIC and processors. If packet forwarding completes in the memory, it generates memory traffic that doubles the network traffic, and forwarding a packet requires six sequential memory access. So, once researchers and processor vendors has developed the idea of direct catch access that allows NIC to bypass the memory and read or write data directly in the fast processor catch. In the optimal case, if we complete all operations in the catch, forwarding packets generate zero memory traffic and forwarding latency is reduced from the scale of memory access to that of catch access. Intel was the only vendor that provided such optimization in its commercial products when we started this work. Intel called this feature Dead Direct I.O. or DDIO. DDIO was introduced to Intel's server processor in 2012 and had its own distinctive rules. If target lines reset in the cache, Nick reads from or write to the cache and bypass the memory. It's good, but we are not always so lucky. If Nick wants to write to an address not in the catch, it will allocate catch lines in two spatial ways in the last level catch. The location is limited so that catch will not be polluted by overflowing network traffic. If Nick wants to read from an address that's not in the catch, it will source from memory without any location in the catch. It's reasonable because usually we will not read send packets again. That's all we, what we know about DDIO, and we will later see that there are more undocumented details than documented. In order to characterize the performance of DDIO, we could use the well-known average memory access time. As the formula guides, the performance of a catch system depends on two issues. First, the hit rate, and the second, the penalty of a catch miss. But to model bounds, we need to learn more details about DDIO that Intel does not reveal. The most important but unknown implementation of the DDIO is that how DDIO and catch coherence protocol cooperate. Conventionally, processor adopt an inclusive hierarchy, which means that a low-level catch has a possible stale copy of all data of a higher level. 
For example, the last level catch has a copy for each catch line in the L2 catch. It's simplifies management, but wastes real space because the same catch lines are stored more than once. But in a non-inclusive catch hierarchy, a catch line present in L2 may not have a copy at L3 and its state are checked by a new component called the snoop filter. Such a design gives better space efficiency but requires more complicated catch coherence protocol. It's unknown how DDL requests are handled in a non-inclusive catch hierarchy. For example, let's consider the case that Nick wants to read a catch line that's present only in L2. It has many possibilities of what will happen. Possibility one, Nick may read directly from L2 and bypass L3. Possibility two, Nick may move catch lines to the two way, TDL ways and read from there. Possibility three, Nick may move catch lines to anywhere in L3 and read from there because, because this is not DDL right and may not be limited by the allocation rule we discussed above. So what's the answer? The answer is none of the story is correct. But before we answer the question, let me show you how we could investigate the catch behavior. The challenge here is that the Nick instead of the processor that sends DDL requests. So we could not easily synthesize the random memory assessed sequences to play with. Instead, we need to find a way to utilize the normal packet handling frameworks. As we have shown above, packet buffers are moved between different rings during the packet forwarding. We notice that the device driver will try to fill the RX ring with empty buffers. So there are always enough buffers for a potential packet burst. If the system load is low, all queens are empty except the receiving replenishment ring. When we forward a packet, the buffer storing the packet is, is successively assessed by the NIC processor and NIC again. As we know, DDL write is locating. So the buffer must reside in the cache after a DDL write. When the buffer packet is sent, the buffer is pushed back to the tail of the RX ring. The NIC will eventually use it, but it may have been evicted to the memory during the wait, just like how hot iron cools down. Since buffers are always in the heating and cooling loop, we call this process buffer engineering. We could control the heating approach by controlling how incoming packets are handled. For example, if we forward the packet without reading the content, the buffer is written and read by the NIC only. If we update the packet header during forwarding, the buffer is first written by the NIC and then the processor and then read by the NIC again. We may also tune the length of the RX ring so buffers may cool down for shorter or longer. We could compare buffer properties up to cooling, such as the heat rate of the NIC ride to investigate the catch behavior. Let's see an example. If we want to know what happens when processor reads a buffer that NIC has just right, we could lay the packet generator sends traffic at a very low rate and lay the device on the test to keep the receiving and discarding packets, but read and the update part of it. The larger the processor write ratio, the more buffer is written by the processor before being discarded. Then we could find that generally, the larger the processor write ratio, the larger the PCIe write hit rate. And meanwhile, the more catch lines are hit in the snoop filter inclusive state, which means that they are present in the L2 catch. The PCIe write hit rate increases because L2 catch is larger than the DDL portion of last level catch in our experiments. So more buffer are kept in the catch. It why it is that catch lines written by the processor core are moved to its L2 catch in a non-inclusive hierarchy. We could use a similar approach to answer the question we have not answered yet. Similar to the previous experiment, this time we let the device on the test for the packets. So a larger processor write ratio means more buffers are written by the processor and they remain in the L2 cache before being read by the NIC. Interestingly, we find that PCI write hit rate reaches its maximum when the processor write ratio is around 0.5. We guess that catch lines in L2 are moved to somewhere other than DLO waste in the last level cache. But where is it moved? We find it by adding a destructor program that heavily exploits the last level catch. We let it interfere one way at a time to see when the PCIe write hit rate drops. As the result shows, when the processor write ratio is low, interference on the left two ways takes effect. 
but when the processor write ratio is high, inference on the right two ways takes effect. Such a spatial role of these two ways is not revealed yet. So the answer to our question is that catch lines are moved to the rightmost two ways when the MIG reads them. It is a little unexpected, at least for us. Using a similar approach, we get this large and complete catch transition table for DDIO on bounds inclusive and non-inclusive catch hierarchy. The travel of buffer in the catch hierarchy is somewhat random. For example, a packet may be moved to DDIO ways by nick write, then moved to L2 by processor read or write, then moved to shell two ways by nick read. It may be bounced back between L2 and the shell ways. It may also be evicted to the last level catch. A similar random work is available on the inclusive catch hierarchy. As a result, network buffers may use much more catch than you would expect, far beyond the two DDIO ways. Now we know that catch lines may be more than two states. We measure the memory access latency to catch lines in different locations and with different coherence states. First, it's clear that catch coherence matters for bounce inclusive and non-inclusive catch hierarchies. Generally, assess catch lines only in the last level catch is much faster than assess those in L2 or with a copy in L2. Second, it's a little interesting that catch miss may not be slower than catch hit. For write, it's reasonable because in a write miss, we need to evict one existing catch lines to leave rooms, but this eviction is moved out of the critical path and the write buffer hides the latency. But if we have a copy in a higher level catch, we need to invalidate them and the invalidation is on the critical path. But third, it's very strange that DC read to catch lines in L2 with shared state is amazingly slow. It's much slower even than reading from memory. We don't find any reasonable explanation for this phenomenon, but we observe that memory requests and coherence requests are bound sent. It leads to an interesting case where a memory request is generated for catch hit. And finally, partial catch line write is different from full catch line write. For a partial catch line write, not updated data should be read from the memory, but the full catch line write could discuss their data in the memory. So it's much, much faster than partial catch line write. Now we know that states of buffer decides the assist latency, but we still need to know the catch hit rate. As shown, during packet forwarding, a buffer may be assessed three times by the NIC and the processor. In the optimal case, all assesses reach the catch and the hit rate is equal to one. But how could we estimate the hit rate under more considerations? Let's recall the buffer life cycle. A buffer continues towards several FIFO queens. We could call buffer's positions in the processing pipelines as its logical state. The logical state transits circularly. Meanwhile, the buffer's location in the memory hierarchy also keeps changing. We call its location in the memory hierarchy as its physical state. Obviously, transitions of logical and physical state are correlated. Let's discuss a rather simple system with only two physical states. One, in the catch, and two, not. We could use a vector to back the probability catch lines in different physical states and use a transition metric to describe how the physical state change as the logical state changes. When NIC or processors assess the buffer, the change of the physical state is deterministic and it could be obtained from the catch coherence protocol we have found. For DDL, since NIC write and process assess are allocating, the buffer must reside in the catch after the assess. But NIC read is not allocating, so it keeps its original state. Similarly, when a buffer waits in a FIFO queen, it may be evicted from the catch, and the eviction probability is decided by bounce the length of the queen and the memory assess intensity. You could find more details on how this probability is estimated in our paper if you are interested. Once our metrics are available, we could solve such an equilibrium equation to get a stable probability of our Markov model. And as you see, the stable probability at a certain logical state is just the expected hit rate that we are interested in. We could model the performance of DDL presetly now 
and it could help us in networking parameter tuning. For example, the tuning of RX ring sets usually meets an impossible trinity. If we want a low packet drop rate and the resistance to traffic fluctuation, we need to allocate a large enough RX ring, but it gives large memory traffic unless enough cache is, is allocated for it. Our model could help the product tuning in this problem because memory traffic could be estimated from hit rate as shown in the figure. If we set the ring size to 1024 to minimize the packet drop rate, our model could predict the required weights for DDL to meet certain memory traffic constraints. We have learned many things in our journey and now it's time to conclude. We find that microarchitecture is very critical to the performance of end house networking. The modern memory hierarchy is complete and sometimes gives us counterintuitive results. Now, hardware and software co-design is necessary for the involution of bound size into the end host networking. Thanks for your listening, and please contact me if you had any question on our paper.